Give me the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Councillor Stapleton, do you have a motion on approval of a special meeting agenda? I do. I move approval of the special meeting agenda. Second. Any discussion? Reporter, please call the roll. Um, Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Gwen. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Oh, sorry. He said aye. Sorry. Yeah. I have bad yeah. hearing. Um, Councillor Hoy's absent. Councillor Norvig. Aye. Councillor Barney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Mayor Hoyle? Aye. Motion passes. Councilor Stapleton, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? No. All right. So that takes us right down to the business of information reports. And we have a uh, presentation from staff. And I think uh, City Manager Staley is going to kick us off. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to to start. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Keith Staley. I am the city manager, uh, and I am going to start this uh, uh, discussion this evening because this really is the start of a discussion. And we are going to put a, a recommendation out in front of you, but uh, by no means do we think that that's where we're going to end up a year from now. But uh, we have to start somewhere. So. Uh, one of my responsibilities as the city manager is to prepare and present uh, this budget to the city council on an annual basis. That, you know, that's in the charter. Uh, the annual budget is how we bring our policy decisions to life. Uh, um, I know that our budget is a direct reflection of our values and the values we deliver to this community. And I also understand that changing the budget means changing our work, changing our people's lives and changing our expectations about the type of community we are and will become. With a potential change in our revenue forecast with the expectation of no new revenue, it is necessary for us to evaluate our five-year budget forecast again and consider the impacts on this year's budget and the budgets for the next four years. The sooner that we make these adjustments, the more time we'll have to consider options and respond responsibly our updated five-year budget forecast reflects this approach. Josh will provide an overview of this work in his presentation, and there is more detail in the staff report and the support materials for today's meeting that was posted online. Uh, this recommendation was developed through a lengthy, iterative, and highly collaborative process that engaged the leadership team and their associates from across the organization in over 12 hours of intense conversation and deliberation. The budget recommendation that we'll be discussing this evening represents our first team thinking. And a first team mentality means, for those of you not familiar with that term, means that those who serve on the leadership team, uh, and raise your hand if you serve on the leadership team, uh, are expected to put the interest of the city ahead of the interests of their own department. And while that sounds easy in principle, it is much harder in practice, and I believe that our recommendation this evening does that. It is a first team recommendation. So in building this proposal, we gathered and started with some principles. And the first being that we recognize that we have a structural imbalance in our budget. And we're gonna see some numbers this evening. Uh, starting as soon as next year, if we do not make any changes to the budget, we will experience about a $10 million shortfall in our budget. And then taking no further action, which is not possible, uh, but if we take no further action, the outcome after four more years would be a $63.5 million budget shortfall. So the numbers that we're talking about are significant and they're real. Uh, we agree that we bring the first team mentality to this conversation and the proposed reductions will impact all general fund supported programs uh, to, main to maintain financial solvency and fiscal responsibility by staying above our adopted fund balance policy for the forecast period. So Josh is going to be talking about our fund balance policy here. You're going to hear that phrase, you know, many times this evening. And that was my direction to our team was to stay above fund balance for the 
entirety of the five year forecast period. Our, and as you'll see, our response uh, leaves us about 5% or $1.57 million above our fund balance requirement uh, at the end of the five year period. We agree that the sooner we begin to address the gap, the greater our flexibility to respond will be. Uh, literally starting this year and making amendments this year will allow us greater flexibility going forward to propose smaller cuts sooner rather than postponing cuts and making more severe cuts later. And as you'll see here shortly, we're starting with $6.1 million in cuts out of this year's budget and it increases over time to $18.3 million uh, at, at the end of five years. Delaying the most significant impacts to later years allows us time for exploring revenue options and making necessary organizational adjustments. So we didn't take all $18 million in reductions in year one, uh, we spread them out over the five year uh, time horizon. And frankly, having some fund balance in place right now allows us to do that. The cuts that we propose are strategic. They're not across the board cuts. Uh, I didn't come in and say, all right, everybody give me a 10% reduction. We literally went through our budget on a line by line, program by program basis and said, here, here is where and how we are going to make the cuts. Uh, and then lastly, in regards to the principles that we use, we agreed that all of our support to our homeless response systems would be eliminated from the budget. And this budget proposal does that. Josh will have more details on that. Uh, we anticipate no new revenue. Uh, later this evening, we will ask City Council to initiate a revenue task force early in November to begin consideration of revenue options should the measure be approved and the safe sale and payroll tax be repealed. Should Council decide to do that work, it is unlikely that additional revenue will be in place to affect the proposed impacts included in this year's and next year's budgets. I'll encourage City Council to adopt an amended budget in 2024, uh, early in 2024, uh, and that we use this work that we're starting this evening to help direct the 2025 budget, which we would adopt in uh, or before July 1st of 2024. So uh, we're off doing that work already. Um, I will, uh, um, what we're sharing with you this evening is a proposal or one path. City Council certainly has the ability to take other paths and that's why we're here starting this conversation. I'm sorry that we need to have this conversation and we need to make these hard decisions. I see my job as working to create the circumstances that allow our employees to be successful and to meet the reasonable expectations of our community. And of course, with less revenue, we will not be able to provide the same level of service. This budget proposal reflects that reality. And unfortunately, progress isn't always predictable or linear, and our path forward isn't always clear. That's the nature of the work that we do. Sometimes it's hard and often the impacts of your decisions aren't always clear. The leadership team and I are committed to helping you do this work. And I know that we will be successful by working together and having a shared vision of our future. I hope that you'll all have patience in this process, that you'll grant yourself, staff, each other in the community grace as we do this work over the coming months. Um, we have to recognize that all truly are doing the best we can. And yes, the impacts are real and the decisions are consequential. However, we can only move forward with this together, in this together, in the best way that I know how to do that is to treat everybody with respect. So I hope we can do that moving forward. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Josh uh, for an overview of the information that was included in your staff report. So Josh. Thank <clears throat> Thanks Keith. Uh, Josh Eagleson, Chief Financial Officer. Um, a lot of this was in your packet. There's a couple additional things, but we're going to walk through on the screen. And you should have the slides in front of you as well. Um, just to start off, a few goals from the work session. Uh, we'd like to share information how we got here, um, the current and projected financial picture, uh, and then the potential budget reductions that Keith alluded to, and then some key questions we're hoping to get your feedback on. 
Josh, I apologize, but I'm going to have to ask you to try to speak up so people in the back can hear you. Understood. Because yeah. we're not amplified here in the room. Yeah. And gotcha. So I think they're struggling because I know I I'm not struggling, but I'm close to struggling. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. We're struggling in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, key questions and feedback, who should be involved in continuing conversations? Uh, you, Keith mentioned this is a revenue task force. Um, uh, the budget committee is also a consideration. Uh, what should community engagement look like? We've listed a few options in the staff report there. Um, then also, uh, when should we revisit the community survey? We kind of took a pause this year. Um, when should we bring that back? That's just a few goals. Uh, we're gonna start with the first uh, couple is to share information. And I apologize, it's a lot of numbers, uh, but it is in your staff report, uh, and you can always go back and find it later. Uh, Keith talked about fund balance, uh, and really where the story starts is in the upper left-hand corner uh, with the beginning fund balance for the current year, fiscal year 2024. Uh, fund balance, if you're not familiar, you could call it working capital, you could call it a savings account, a checking account. It's money that's carried over from year to year in the general fund. Uh, the city has more than 24 funds. The general fund is just one of them. Uh, the, the fund balance can't be commingled uh, necessarily. This is the general fund allocation. Uh, so you can't move funds from the utility fund or building safety. It's just, just general fund. And that's funded with property taxes, franchise revenue, city operations fee, and about uh, you know 100 other line items. That beginning fund balance uh, is about four more than $4 million less than we started in 2023. So we did use fund balance to balance the budget, to balance expenditures in 2023. Uh, we won't know the precise amount. The audit is still ongoing. It'll be complete in December. That's how local government works. It's a long process. Uh, that, that, that fund balance, there's a couple reasons. I, I listed a full page of them in the back of the packet about why it's important. I'm gonna talk about two of them. Uh, one is cash flow. Uh, for those of you that own a home, uh, you get a property tax statement, you get a bill, you get it in October and you pay it at some point. Uh, the city doesn't receive those funds until November, the first large batch of them, and then they trickle in throughout the year. So we have to fund services July, August, September, and October before we get those property tax receipts. So there is a true cash flow need to have money in the bank to be able to make payroll and make vendor payments until we get those property tax receipts. The, the second one that's very notable, uh, the safety and livability bond that passed this last November, uh, we went to issue $100 million uh, of bonds and part of that process is a credit rating. So we go to Moody's uh, and we, talk about our financials. They listen to our five-year forecast meetings. They read our documents. They say, hey, what's your plan? We said, hey, we're looking at revenue options. Uh, the council's shown strong fiscal responsibility in the past for reductions and revenue additions. So they're okay. But if you see that fund balance drop further without any plan to replenish it, it's a red flag and it could result in a downgrade, which does two things. It increases the cost of borrowing which results in less projects being completed. It costs more to borrow money. We can only borrow $100 million. It costs more, uh, so it's less projects. Those are those are two reasons. There's five others listed there on the back. Josh, we'll definitely stop and do screen sharing. Sorry, I thought. Hey Josh, could you touch on the fact that we passed a $300 million bond, but yet you're only talking about $100 million? Could you clarify that for folks? Sure. So uh, the bond measure the last November authorized a total of $300 million. Uh, we don't have the financial capacity or the project management capacity to do it all at once. Uh, so we're issuing it in three tranches, three uh, issuances. So $100 million, $100 million, $100 million every three years. So here in two more years, we'll be looking to do it again. Um, and we're hoping to maintain our credit rating and have a good financial picture to talk to the credit agency about. I think we got that shared. Uh, this next line is net revenues. Uh, that's just all the revenues that come in. So when I talked about property taxes, franchise fees, miscellaneous revenues, parks and recreation registrations, everything that comes into the general fund uh, goes right here. Total expenditures, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here on the next four lines because this can get uh, 
pretty confusing. So the total expenditures, think of it as a budget. This is what we're allowed to spend. So in the city of Salem, just like I talked to my other uh, uh, counterparts in other large cities in, in Oregon, everyone does it this way. You budget fully for every single position, uh, you know, all the wages, merit increases, cost of living adjustments, uh, benefits. Um, but throughout the year, things change. Uh, you have vacancies, you have turnover, uh, you have savings. Um, and for us, that shows up in really two categories. One is we budget $3 million for contingency. Uh, we have to come to council to ask for it. Uh, but we anticipate only spending about $2.5 million of it. So we have $3 million available. It's absolutely necessary. When the ice storm happened, we accessed a lot of it. Um, and it, it gives the council flexibility to make changes mid-year. Um, that next line, that 2.5% savings, that's for vacancies. So, so if the a position's in transition, it's open for a few months, that's where that is captured and comes back into the general fund and gets programmed again for the next year. And that gets us to the net expenditures. So these are- I'm sorry, quick question about net revenues. Uh, in looking and forecasting, gazing into your crystal ball, of course, for future years, are you assuming an continual increase in property value? for the upcoming fiscal years, and if so, what are you anticipating we're going to continue to see those grow over time? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So statutorily, we see 3% increase. So on your property tax bill, your assessed value goes up 3% every year, like clockwork. In addition to that 3%, we in Salem, we do uh, see some healthy new development. We do see new properties come on the tax rolls. So we see an additional 1, 1.1, 1 1.5%. So we're anticipating about 4.1% increase uh, year over year. And that's just for property taxes. Each revenue has its own, its own assumption. So net expenditures, that's money going out the door, either through payroll checks or vendor checks. Um, that's actually cash leaving. Uh, the fund balance spend, um, all of these years, you show a fund balance spend. Um, that's the difference between the net revenues and the net expenditures. So that's the use of fund balance. So your savings is going down by $9.4 million. And that gets you to this ending fund balance. Now this year right here, uh, 2024, this anticipates the current status quo, all the new positions as if we would have filled them. So it's really, uh, it's not going to happen this way. We're coming back with a recommendation. We're proposing some changes. But this service level going forward, this is the picture. So like Keith mentioned, the fund balance policy there in the second row to the bottom, 15% of revenues, you know, those two couple very important reasons we have to have that fund balance in place. And if we were in a different situation, I'd actually be asking to have a little bit more. 15% is a little light. Uh, to have on hand. We still struggle to cash flow through October. Uh, we'd be asking for something more like 20%, but 15% is okay. It's, a, it's been the council policy since 2009. What this year looks like is you end the year slightly over policy, uh, but what you have going forward is this extremely unbalanced uh, structural imbalance between revenues and expenditures where you start spending at 9.4 in the current year, and then it escalates to approximately 19 million in year five. And just, just right up front, we'll be talking about it a little bit later, this does not include homeless services. It doesn't include the micro shelters or the navigation center. Those are not currently in the general fund, but that's approximately another $10 million on top of this. 10 million per year. 10 million annually, yeah, that's correct. So it, in this picture, uh, you'd be completely out of general fund balance at the end of 2026. Uh, the same year, uh, you, you couldn't adopt the budget that year either. So, so we have restrictions by the state. Uh, we have to submit the budget to them annually. You have to submit a balanced budget. The way we do that right now with that fully appropriate budget is we have fund balance to offset that. If you don't have the fund balance, you have to reduce your expenditures to match the resources you have. It's not, not an option. We can't deficit spend. So before I go any further, are there any questions just on this baseline? Yes, ma'am. I have one question. So you said that you're not going to 
so the ending balance for 2023, that's an estimate, right? You don't have those final numbers. No, and uh, so, so we, we're, we're pretty darn close uh, to where we think we're going to land, um, but honestly, things lag a lot. Uh, so like we, we're still receiving revenue right now that we have to post back to 2023. So this includes some revenue that we haven't received yet. If I had to put where we're really at, it'd be a couple million dollars less. Um, and then, and then even, even then, up until December 31st, when we have to submit the audit, uh, they could still ask us to make changes if they find something that needs to be changed. So it's preliminary, yes. But I, I'm, I'm confident, uh, you know, I think it's 4.3 that we're expecting to spend last year. You know, it's going to be that or higher. I guess just for kind of uh, clarity purposes, I do have a question. Um, during the community citizens budget committee process, we uh, had touched on the fact that the city of Salem is short staff in every department. Uh, if we were to have kept up uh, compared to 2008, you know, we're behind like three, 307.5 FTEs. With this number here in our, in the year that we're currently in 2024 of a net expenditure of 179.1, are there any new FTEs? Because, you know, if we were successful with the operations fee, which we did pass unanimously, and there's, I guess, a possibility that we could get an a employee payroll tax um, does this include any of those new FTEs to, to make up for the deficit of staff that we've had? Yeah, I appreciate the question. It does. So it's a pro I think it's 38 positions that were added in the general fund between the city operations fee and the other new positions that were recommended in the budget. So this, this number of 179 includes those 38 new FTEs? Yes, that's correct. That, that's why it's the baseline forecast. So we'll, we'll look at the scenario down the road in just a couple of slides where it, it peels out those exact positions. Yep. Uh, you might have seen slides like this, uh, similar slides in the past in the forecast document. We've included every year some notable things over the past couple decades. Uh, this is a little different. It shows our fund balance compared to our fund balance policy. Like I mentioned earlier, the fund balance policy was adopted in 2009. So you see the fund balance getting a little more stable after that point. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the city council has used different measures uh, to balance the budget. Uh, there's really two levers. You can add revenue or you can reduce expenditures. The council's done both. In 2010, uh, there was a reduction of approximately 43 positions. Again, in 2013, a, a reduction of 26 positions. 46. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I wanted to note uh, PERS legislative rate relief, if you're not familiar with the Morrow decision, um, basically the state tried to implement some uh, legislative changes to the PERS system and lowered the PERS rates. The city continued to budget at the higher rate, so we accumulated the delta, the difference in those rates in the general funds. That Morrow decision was overturned, so it was a really good thing that the city did that. And that's where you start to see the decline again right after that point. A uh, couple other notable changes. So the reductions in 2010 and 2013, and then the addition in 2017 of uh, Fire Station 8, the Homeless Rental Assistance Program in 2018, and then reopening Fire Station 11 in 2019. And then uh, more recent history, uh, 2020 was the implementation of the city operations fee and then beginning of the CARES and ARPA funding, the one-time federal relief that we received. So that's why this picture looks really good, uh, and I'll show you why it's not as good as it looks uh, here in a couple slides. Actually, I'm going to show you right now. Uh, so, so this is the baseline forecast, except for a couple more years. So if you look in the bottom right, it's the exact same picture as the previous slide uh, with the addition of 2017 uh, through through 2023. Um, so all this is, this one is just to show the difference between this slide and this next slide. Without that CARES and ARPA funding, we deficit, we had deficit spending actual dollars where we reduced fund balance in 2017, 2018, 2019. If we hadn't received federal CARES and ARPA funding, we would have continued to spend fund balance all, every single year uh, through the current year. So that was a Band-Aid. It masked an issue. Um, it was a, a conscious choice uh, to build that fund balance to give flexibility. We knew that the issue was happening back in 2020 
there was a payroll tax on the ballot at that point. It was pulled, and this one-time revenue uh, was able to bolster fund balance to give us a flexibility to have the conversations that we're having now. Uh, this third slide, and I like to highlight this, the city operations fee that the city council implemented in 2020. If it hadn't implemented that city operations fee, uh, we would have been out of, out of compliance with the fund balance policy in 2020 and completely out of fund balance two years ago in 2022. So there are mechanisms, reductions, and revenue increases that can balance the budget. Chuck, can you remind us how much did we receive in total ARPA funds? Uh, total we received, I think it was $34.1 million. And we've spent it all, I assume. Correct, yes. There's a little bit uh, that's allocated but not spent, but yeah, it's all, it's all committed. Yes. And, and that was the requirement. So 2024, all of it has to be committed by the end of the year. I, I, before I leave here, any additional questions? So the forecast with the budget adjustments, uh, Councillor Phillips, your question earlier about the different positions. Uh, there's there's three different lines here on this chart than that first one. Uh, eliminate the ops fee positions. The city operations fee was increased with certain positions tied to it. This reduces most of those positions. And then eliminating the other new positions that were added in the general fund. So those are the first two lines. And then the third one, additional reductions that we'll go through. And hopefully you've had a chance to look at those also. Are you going to outline those? I know we have that information, but I want to make sure the public is aware of the positions that are being... Yeah, we'll be walking through those, yeah. And uh, and when we get there, feel free to ask clarifying questions. We'd like to save you know, deliberations and that kind of discussion until a little bit later, but if you want to clarify what a position does or what the program is, you know, feel free. Uh, what this does is exactly what Keith said. Uh, his direction was to balance the five years within the fund balance policy, making incremental changes. So there in year five, 2028, we end with $1.6 million in fund balance uh, above the policy. So that, that might seem like a lot or it might seem like a little. To me, it seems like a very little amount. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, with this size of budget, that's practically nothing. There can be little variations that either uh, double that or, or go the other direction pretty easily. So it's a forecast. We're using it as a forecast. It's simply a tool to project revenues and expenses. But with this projection, uh, it would mean that we land just over fund balance policy. I guess to kind of highlight this uh, for, for clarification purposes again, um, I see that, you know, with these recommendations, we're just barely above the 15%. But practically speaking, I heard you say that in October, we struggle with cash flow. And maybe just briefly kind of explain when do we get our revenues and what happens if we don't have enough, you know, in the bank on any given month? Yeah, a really good question. So if we basically essentially have to borrow in October, the general fund accrues negative interest. So generally when you have money, when you have uh, $30 million sitting in the bank, you accrue investment earnings and interest. Uh, if you go negative, uh, you accrue negative interest and it, it's not a good practice. Um, we're, we're fortunate that other funds have healthy fund balances. That's not always the case. We want each fund to stand on its own. Um, but that, that's what we have to do to get to November when we get that big property tax receipt. I, I will mention the city operations fee has helped with that equation. Uh, we receive monthly, uh, monthly cash from the city operations fee, so it's helped spread out uh, the need for funding. Uh, after this meeting, I'm wondering if you could send me what this slide would look like, but with a 20% fund balance policy. I would be really interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is just a couple graphs. It shows the same information just in a graphical display. So this is that first baseline forecast. Uh, and this is the forecast with reductions. It might not look very different. We are talking about a marginal increase. Um, but I've used it to, if you're, if you're orienteering and you have a compass and you're a couple degrees off, uh, you, you can end up miles and miles away from where you want to go. So what these strategic adjustments do is it lands us right above that fund balance policy. So you can see we're still spending 
we're still spending fund balance, but we have that fund balance to make that flexibility. And the, the green line is just above that yellow line. I, I think one question uh, or one comment we would make is that, you know, in this situation, uh, with no structural fix to our revenues and expenditures, you'd continue to have this discussion every year. So we're looking at reductions that happen most every year. And after 2028, you'd continue to have that discussion because there's no fix to that structural imbalance. Property taxes continue to grow at a slower rate than expenses. I guess I'm just at the risk, another clarifying point. So like there's a state constraint that property taxes are limited to 3% every year, but uh, we get an extra one, one and a half percent based on growth. But does that growth give us pure revenue or does it have some cost associated with it? Uh, so there, so that comes from new development, which does come from service demands. I think one of the challenges that uh, it, You'd think that it would pay for the service, but what the reality is that 4, 4.14.5% doesn't pay for current staffing, let alone adding staffing to actually address that increased service demand. So, so yes, it's great to get the new revenue. It does come with more, res, more residents, more service demands, more call volume. Thank you. I see a question. I know, I'm trying to formulate it. So I'm trying to make you not go forward. <laughs> So I think someone maybe in our community might hear you say that and say, well, stop spending so much, right? So why can you just tell everyone again, why our costs are more than our revenue and how, what, are, what is the percentage of growth in our costs and what do those costs, what is that made up of? Sure, I don't have that precise number ready, uh, but, uh, Generally, 80% uh, of our costs are people. So in the general fund, you're providing services. Those services are provided by people. Uh, those, most of our employees are part of a collective bargaining uh, unit, uh, union. Um, they're PERS employees. Uh, they have health benefits. They have workers' comp premiums and other things. The majority of those costs are outside our control. The PERS rates are handed to us by the state. A collective bargaining agreement. We have, um, you know, binding arbitration for several unions. Uh, so even if we said, hey, we can't afford this, it can go to binding arbitration. We have to pay it anyway. So most of our costs are outside our control. The only thing we can control is the number of staff. Thank you. I'm going to ask a difficult question. <laughs> Um, it's not a reality. Like, are we are locked at that three percent based on state, you know, ballot initiatives that happened in the early '90s? But theoretically, what would keep us up with the increased cost that we have over time? Like three point five, four point one, and I don't even expect the number tonight. Like, moving forward, what what would it take to keep us like balanced? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I don't have that tonight it's more than 4.1 or 4.5 and i will say uh you know it evolves right so so some more costs are mandated um it, you know pers rates increase things change um the economy goes a little wonky and you have a couple years of very very high inflation um so so costs it's hard to contain it within right. a very uh predictable but insufficient property tax system Any other? No. Uh, so going through the the actual services we're talking about. Um, so for the new city operations fee position, so the city operations fee was increased in July to five dollars by five dollars and fifty cents. Uh, it included two park rangers. Uh, those are proposed for elimination. Two code enforcement officers. Those are also proposed for elimination. Uh, the SOS team. Um, which I'm blanking on what that stands for at the, for the second, but the uh, homeless services team uh, that does camp cleanups and homeless cleanup. Uh, we currently provide service five, five days a week. This was proposed to add two additional days to make it all seven days a week. We lose a lot of ground on those Saturdays and Sundays is what I'm told. Um, so while we're not proposing to reduce the baseline SOS team we currently have, we're proposing not to expand it. Uh, 
In addition, there were some uh, internal service positions that were proposed there. So that was that first line, the first gray line on the forecast. Uh, this next category was the second one, um, other new positions. So internal services, HR, IT, finance. Uh, we had a grants position, uh, HR business partner, um, department tech support analyst, several other positions there. A library supervisor, a police crime analyst, a fire training officer, and an admin analyst in the urban, develop in the urban development department that was part of their reorg. So we, we moved a couple of their positions and this was to give them some capacity back. Any questions on these, these ones? Uh, these are all vacant, currently vacant positions. Yes, thank you, Dan. So everything we're looking at for 2024 either is vacant or can quickly become vacant uh, with other things. You can shift positions around. So we're not talking about layoffs in 2024. We're talking about eliminating vacancies, not hiring them, and you won't see them in the budgets going forward. How many vacancies do we have right now citywide? Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. It, it changes daily. Would we, you say it's more or less than 50? I, I really don't. I don't have a number. Okay. Uh, going on, the additional reductions for 2024, uh, six currently vacant library FTE, six uh, fire positions and four police positions. Uh, the services are listed in your in your packet, what they actually represent. But uh, while they are vacant positions, they do represent services that are going away. For example, the library, uh, this represents the West Salem branch being closed whenever this is adopted. Um, the police positions, I think it's the drug enforcement unit, if I'm not mistaken, as well as the community engagement lieutenant and another sergeant. For 2025, before we move on, yeah, and I, I apologize if it's better to like ask these questions at the end. I, I can move, try to do that moving forward. But I think that the reduction to you know police and fire and even library, it's kind of important to highlight right now. Um, some of us have had a chance to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff prior to tonight's meeting. But what is that expected to do, for example, to the call response time when people call 911 um, in terms of you know reducing police and fire by you know six and four, as mentioned on this. Uh, these are vacant positions in the fire department. Uh, so what this really means for us is other members who are already working mandatory overtime are going to be called into work more to cover the minimum staffing each day. Um, we really don't see an impact on our, our response times until we close the station. Once you start closing stations, then you start eliminating boots on the street. Uh, and that's where you really start getting into the snowball effect of not being able to meet response times. We don't meet them now. but We'll be meeting a lot less moving forward if you close facilities down. So in the short term, what I'm hearing you say, Chief, is that there's not an impact to call response times in this fiscal budget, which ends at the June of next year, 2024. And that, that's nuanced because we're seeing a 6.4% increase in our calls yeah. this year. Throughout the year, our fires are up. You know, So looking towards the end of the year, I'm expecting that our ability to meet the response time will be lower than last year. Um, so there's that additional 2,500 calls we add almost every year. Um, some years it's 5,000 calls more. So um, technically you're correct, but I think when you look at the whole picture, um, those response times are being impacted every year with our existing resources. So any cuts degradates that. But Chief, you're, you're, you're focusing on response times. I know that's an easy metric and sure. we look at it all the time. But there are other impacts to your department Absolutely. that aren't response times. Yep. There's impacts to the people. Right? Absolutely, the employees who are yep. being mandated. There's and employee staffing. Yep, and, and and when we have those negative impacts on those employees, I'm assuming that our over our turnover goes up. Our it can. I think long term, uh, if 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 this whole uh, recommendation comes to fruition, um, there is a definite possibility of of employees looking at you know our environment here and saying, uh, do I want to run, run 27 calls in a 24 hour shift? Or do I want to work for a department where I run seven calls and I have, have a better staffing? So I think long term, it could have an impact on our ability to recruit new employees. Certainly, it has an impact, and I don't want to minimize this, you know, since the pandemic, um, you know, firefighters, police officers, dispatchers, they didn't get to work from home. They, they stayed the whole time. So 
uh, and work volume went up, 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 up. So they're asked to, to cover mandatory shifts, cover extra shifts, time away from their families. Yes, they get compensated for it. They make time and a half, but um, you can only do so much of that before you get burned out. And I think we're, you know, we're on that, we're on the cusp of that right now where we can't push much further and ask them to do much more. Um, you know, our, our, our troops try to, you know, perform to protect the community. That's, what, that's their mission. So they do everything they can to do that. But at some point there's a breaking point where you're doing too much on both ends, asking people to, you know, work four days out of five is not healthy. It's not good for them to be at work that long, especially with the workload that they have. That was my follow-up question as well, was specifically about burnout. So even though this may not, you know, technically have a response time impact in this fiscal year that ends at the end of next June, it does have a very like real toll on the people who work on the first, you know, as our first responders. Yes, there's six positions that are going to need to be filled on a daily basis that are there that won't be there anymore. That'll be filled by existing employees. So when there's a vacancy, they got to work overtime because these six these six bodies will be gone. And generally speaking, do people volunteer for that, or do you have to force them? Uh, it's a mix. Um, you know, it just depends on how many, you know, if you've worked a 72 hour shift and they're calling you to work overtime, you're probably gonna say, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested. Some people volunteer. And then other times we have to mandatory people, Hey, you're a captive audience. You're going off. You're going to work another day. And we try not to do that, but there, you know, we got to keep trucks in service too. So it's a balance. <coughs> yeah. Um, what were those set, excuse me, what were uh, the set staffing level levels based on? Because it sounds like you have a set staffing level, and if you have vacancies or whatever, then everyone has to to fill it. You use sure. overtime. Um, so, what are those levels? So, right you? now, we are staffed with forty three individuals on shift every day. That's eleven engine companies, two ladder companies, and two battalion chiefs for the entire city. Um, if if we have people that are on sick leave or they're taking, you know, FEMLA or OFLA or the new PLO or they're on vacation or they're on a Kelly day, if they're away from work, then we have to fill those spots. Uh, and so either fill them with a floater, we have some floater positions. Um, we're down a total of 17 FTEs total right now, uh, minus the six that we're proposing here, that puts us down to 11. So a lot of our floaters are not filled right now. And so people have to work those shifts to cover the, the minimum staffing for each day. So that, that's the that's a number of people it takes to operate the city, all the city fire stations, and all the equipment. And at some point, we had four person trucks. Yes, and that's we correct. at some point made a decision to go to three person. We we um, it was a temporary measure. Uh, it's been eleven years, um, and what we did was uh, we said, hey, we'd like to use one person off the ladder truck, a firefighter, to cover an overtime spot to reduce our overtime exposure. So on days when we needed to hire somebody, we would take one person off, they'd run with a three person ladder, we'd put this other person over to cover position and there wouldn't be any overtime. So we do that almost every day now. Uh, that's just how it's just evolved that way. Uh, that's, that's not the best scenario. Having a four person ladder truck is, is, the, is the optimal uh, or five. Uh, we run with three, so which is the minimum. And it, it does have impacts on, you know, splitting the crew up, you know, two and two, you can split up into two groups, three, you stick together as one group. So you can get more work done with four people on a truck. So that's how we do that. Um, and optimally, we need nine more fire stations in this community to meet the response time standard that we have set as a community. So that's how far behind we are. In, and that's why it's, you know, when you look at these cuts, it's like we're going the wrong direction, but it is what it is. How much more expensive is it to pay the overtime rather than just having the position? So we, we did a comprehensive study on that um, when I first took over as chief in 2009. Um, and we actually analyzed it a little bit before that, but the study again, we calculate that if, if an individual covers a spot 85% of the time, so a floater that's on that shift covers that spot, 85% of the time they're filling a vacant spot, it's better to have a floater do that, so a full-time employee versus somebody on overtime. But with our, you know, the history of PERS and the cost, the burden cost for an employee, there isn't really that much difference anymore between time and a half and a full burdened employee. And so we, we look at that very carefully and, and try to, you know, be, we try to be fully staffed. Um, I made the decision not to fully staff this what's going on right now. Um, I don't know what the future is going to hold, so I don't want to hire people and lay them off next year. 
uh, two, what, what yeah. about a two-tiered fire response system? Two-tiered response system. Portland's looking at that now. At what point do we look at that? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Two-tiered meaning what? In other words, that way we keep our trucks on the, on the streets. In other words, we get there, we try to assess, or maybe by the phone call, try to assess who's going to respond to that. That was just not a full fire truck, fully staffed. I guess I'm not. I'm not fall. I'm not. I'm not aware of that program, so I'd have to look into that. Are you talking about squads that go, or how, is it something through dispatch or? Okay. I, yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, the two tiered response in Portland. Okay. They're looking at it now, so because okay. they're further down. The road. Yeah. Mike, could you speak to the impacts um, of these four police officer positions and much like Chief Niblock did, what does that mean for our community? I think uh, yeah, we're not tied to necessarily response times as much as the fire department is, right? It's a different way of thinking about staffing. Um, so we have to think about it a little differently. But uh, for this, I'd have to step back and think about, you know, the story I've been telling for a while now about death by, death by a thousand cuts, right? So if you grow for 10 years without keeping up with the pace of growth in your city, then you're making little cuts along the way for the past 10 years. And so what that looks like is you have certain core services that you have to provide as a police department. You have to answer your 911 calls. You have to have your uniformed patrol officers out there handling emergencies. Um, that's a baseline function that you have to perform as a police department. Then there's layers going out from there where you have officers or, or specialized assignments that are detached from the 911 call response. So these are your more proactive units, our community policing units, um, our downtown bicycle officers, uh, officers doing drug enforcement proactively. Right? They're not handling 911 emergency calls, they're doing proactive work. And so if you don't keep pace with growth over, the growth over the years, you start to chip away at those specialized assignments to make sure that you're meeting your core service demands. Well, at some point you get to the point where there's nothing left to pull from without having some significant service impacts. And that's where we find ourselves today. So even taking these two positions, and this is a thought process that we went through. Um, and unfortunately, I have an experience from an agency that I came from, we went through much worse than this, municipal bankruptcy. And I learned how to cut a police department by 25% in one fiscal year. And the way you do that is you start with these layers that you're talking about. One of the first places you look, kind of bankruptcy 101, is your task force officers, because they're assigned to a task force outside of the department. So you retract, you pull those folks back. So that's what we did here. Our two task force officers are assigned to the D drug enforcement unit, uh, would be pulled back so that we can make sure that we have our court services covered. If you look at the full package, it goes farther, but the same process is happening as you're pulling back all of your proactive community engagement type units to make sure that you have patrol staff properly. Don't forget this is all within the context of a community engagement audit, and a subsequent staffing analysis, all since I started two and a half years ago, that said we needed 60 more police officers at the police department. And we're talking about taking a 10 year step backwards when you look at this whole package. If this whole package takes effect, it would be one less officer than we had 10 years ago. So it's a complete step backwards. And so that's a complete retraction of any sort of proactive unit so that you can maintain at least 80 to 90 officers on your patrol shifts um, in total. So that, that's, this is just one step into the cuts that would have to be needed in this full package, but there's nothing left to pull from that's not going to have a direct service impact on the community. That's just where we find ourselves now. I guess um, I, I don't really understand why this the reduction for the officer officers that do the high level drug trafficking cases. I mean, we have a huge drug trafficking problem here. Um, how is this going to impact, impact that? Yeah, it's going to limit our ability. And having officers on a task force like this is, is like a first force multiplier, too, if you think about it, because you sign two officers and you get all sorts of resources from the federal government that you get to partner with. So it's a bigger loss than just the two individual officers, if you think about it that way, too. So it's going to limit our ability for any to interdict high level drug trafficking, um, and connect a lot of connections to illegal gun trafficking as well. Um, but again, it's like bankruptcy 101. You get to a point where you have to staff your core services. I have to make sure the biggest responsibility I have as chief of police, I think of it two parts. Number one, community safety and officer safety. And we're seeing a violent crime increase in our community that's been trending up for about 10 years. It's peaking up over the past few years. So. Violent crime is going up at the same time while, our, while we're under
understaffed, more and more of our resources are being diverted towards emergency response and intervening in violent crime. So you pull away from your proactive units trying to prevent things from happening so you can be more responsive. You're becoming more of a responsive agency instead of, instead of a proactive agency. But your task force officers are the first place you have to look. They're the ones that are assigned to work with someone else. We need them to work with us in our community now. But the farther we go, we're going to continue going down those layers until there's really nothing left but patrol officers, traffic officers, and detectives for serious crimes. So um, I just would like to see, again, you could kind of continue this line of conversation because um, I have had in my ward um, many people that are feeling that missing community support and, um, and feeling, and I will even say unsafe, um, and yet we have other people that feel that the violent crime is not going up as they feel, um, and yet it's like, but it's there, we see it. Um, so there seems to be some miscommunication about the where the officers need to be going to. People feel that sometimes that's the violent crime isn't there, but yet they don't see them helping the community. So can you speak to how those statistics that they're getting from other agencies are kind of interfering with what we're hearing. Also, the police crime analyst that we saw on the previous slide was to help us understand this problem even more, but that's, that's not going to happen also. Um, but we have a 15-year crime summary that's on our transparency portal. So for the past two years, we've been taking a look at 15 years of crime in Salem. So you look at the long-term trends, and there's three types, right? You have all crime. So there's a graph in there that shows kind of all, all reported crime in Salem for 15 years. And you can see the line graph, it's just fairly flat, you know, a little bit of fluctuation. But when you pull out property crime and violent crime, those are two different buckets of crime. Um, property crime looks relatively flat also, but when you pull out violent crime, murders, rapes, aggravated assaults, rob armed robberies, that's been trending up steadily for 15 years, a little bit of variation, but definitely for the past eight years or so, really starting to peak up. And so it depends on what statistics you look at. Overall crime has been flat for 15 years, but if you look at violent crime, it's been trending up and it continues to go up. At the same time, violent crime is going up, assaults on our police officers are going up at the same time. So the work's becoming even more dangerous as well, which, which makes common sense. If you're going to send officers to intervene in more violent crime, there's high likelihood of more violent confrontations occurring. And we're seeing that occurring. And not, not just the number of assaults on officers are up, but the intensity of the assaults, right? Several of our last officer-involved shootings involved people shooting at police officers. So the intensity of the assault is going up as well. So when I talk about my priority being safety in that sense, that's, that's what I get worried about is I have to make sure we're focusing our resources on physical safety of our community members, but also making sure we're taking care of the physical safety of our officers. If we spread ourselves too thin, I have, I have to make sure that the patrol officers that are out there in the field handling calls have the support they need with the training and equipment, but also their partners to help them out and back them up when they need it. We have to have an adequate number to mitigate that inherent risk that's in law enforcement that's there. It seems to be increasing. I mean, just this week, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputy was executed in his police car, just sitting at an intersection and somebody pulled up and executed him. So the, these assaults on officers are, are real um, and we have to make sure we put the, the safety of our officers um, at the forefront here as well. Like we implemented an efficiency measure this past year because we're understaffed. The staffing analysis, the outside staffing analysis gave us some efficiency measures as well. One of those being we should move to a 12 hour shift structure. So we're trying that out. It's a pilot project for the current year that we're in. Um, because we're spreading ourselves too thin, we're having to try to squeeze more out of the agency without adding bodies. You can only spread your staff so thin where I start to worry about their safety. Are they getting enough rest? Is their work life balance appropriate? Are they making good decisions, um, safe decisions? So these are all the factors that are playing into why we talked about the need to add staff to the department in the current budget. And unfortunately, now we're having to look at retracting that and going backwards. Thank you. Chief, you and I, that last point that you made, you and I have talked about that um, several times um, on one-on-ones, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the people who are out in our community making these split-second decisions 
I need them fully rested and I need them, uh, you know, uh, able to be at work and focused fully on the work. Um, that is a community that I want to, I want to see our police force working in that capacity instead of in this strange situation. I feel like it opens us up to uh, more risk and more liability and more, um, more of an opportunity for really um, sad and tragic situations to happen. Um, so I want to confirm that I agree with you on that. I also was wondering, um, do you have numbers on kind of deaths from overdose within Salem over, you know, the past, you know, how is that trend going? And yeah, yeah that's increasing as well. I, I, I do know, I'm not going to have all the data, but last year there was 20 fatal overdose deaths in, in the city limits in here in Salem. That's not the, all the non-fatal overdose that we're dealing with every day. Our officers are saving people with naloxone, same thing with our firefighters. Um, so that, that's increasing, but just the fatal overdoses was 20, um, which was higher than the year before. And it looks like we're on track to surpass it this year too. So there are all sorts of increased service demands being placed on our public safety officials. Again, with this idea, when you look back, right now we're sitting at about 1.1 police officers per thousand residents, 1.1. We should be somewhere around 1.4 or 1.5. Um, 15 years ago or so, we were up around 1.46. This is, this is the death by a thousand cuts that I've been talking about. This isn't a new problem. This is something we've been dealing with in Salem for a long time because of the structural imbalance that we have. We're growing, service demands are increasing, and we haven't been adding commensurate levels of staff. Um, so the impacts are real. Maybe people don't feel it each year because it's a little small incremental change. When you look at it over the long term, these are these are big things that we've been taking on without the increased staff that we need to deal with them. It's got to place us back to uh, 2002 staffing levels. So that was 20 years ago, 23 years ago, um, and our call volume has gone up. Well, since 2010, it's gone up 86 percent. So you know we're. When I first started here, we were running 15,000 calls a year. We ran 32,000 last year. Well, we're going to blow through that this year. Um, the same number of resources. We have not added a person on the street since 2010. So, and the call volume is just at continuing to escalate. All the problems we're seeing, the overdoses, the uh, you know the near overdoses that that we resuscitate, and some of those folks we resuscitate them multiple times. Um, you know, we see the same person three times. We save their life three times. So it's it's really uh, impactful on our on our response force and the community um, with with all the things that are going on. So it's really difficult to keep that level of service where we need it. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe council could get that information. You know, how many folks are we losing? How many folks are we saving um, within this this group of um, within this issue? Because I think it's really important for us, especially if we are pulling back staff from actively working that area within the city as far as proactive work? I can tell you we have uh, approximately 26 cardiac arrest saves every year. Some of those are overdose and uh, precipitated. You know, they, they do drugs and they have a cardiac arrest or respiratory and we get them back. Some of them are just cardiac arrest, heart failure, plumbing problems, electrical problems like that. But um, about 26 a year that we that we're able to resuscitate and when we say save we mean they walk out of the hospital with no neurological deficit back to their family back to their job you know they're 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 not uh, you know diminished if you will so it's a pretty high bar yeah, your 12 hour session with the leadership team you know us as council we set the priority areas we don't we don't ever dictate how many employees you hire fire. Our, we set the priority and then you fulfill it. Uh, during that process, were those priority areas used to, to provide this? Did you guys use this priority? Just like we do during our budget. Yes. Uh, our discussion started around our priority based budgeting system. And I think as we go through this, you'll see that the cuts that we've proposed and the timing of those cuts are directly related to and correlated to our performance based budgeting system. How many employees do we have approximately? All, all 1,357 in the budget with about 750 in the general fund. Yeah, plus or minus. The reason I ask is based on that, okay. looking at the cuts for 2024, uh, police and fire being the majority of those cuts, I mean, that, that 
file to come in line with our priority areas. Like, this is life and death. Yeah. Let's, let's keep going through this because we're by far not done. And you'll see you know, where the, uh, the dollars are coming from and where the service impacts are coming from. No, I reviewed this information, but I'm asking right now for 2024. Is that really the best decision to provide that you can provide to us? We, we think it is. Because yeah. one thing, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, you say that council, it's up to us to provide, to uh, dictate this. But this is the only option we have. Where's A, B, and C? Where, they, where are the other options? There's literally a million options. And I would like to see a few. Let's, this is let, Let's keep going through this, this conversation. And I think you'll see the totality of what was proposed. Uh, so going into 2025, uh, all Salem funding for micro shelters. This is not currently a general fund expense, but it's a notable service reduction. So we wanted to make sure we mention it. Um, so this isn't to say that the micro shelters go away. It means the funding we're providing would go away. Uh, they might be able to identify other funding, um, but Salem would no longer pass through uh, uh, state grants. We wouldn't have that those funding any longer. So we provide virtually all of the funding for those services currently. Correct, with the exception of the Turner Road location where they uh, got some state funding, uh, but the other uh, Catholic Community Services and Village of Hope would uh, likely close. This says fiscal year 2025. What's the date that this happens? So uh, July 1st, 2024. Thank you. So just a few short months away from now. And, and how many micro shelter, managed micro shelter units are at risk? Of losing funding this this summer is it 180? Uh, it's 180 plus the 38, and then I heard that Catholic Community Services, which I'm not sure how their funding is structured, but they're adding another 30 this fall. Uh, I've heard the number 250. I'll have to verify that. I think the 255 includes the navigation center. Got it. Look at us with our numbers. Look at you. Uh, the, uh, and I should note for fiscal year 2025, uh, as opposed to 2024, 2024, they're vacant positions, right? There's no layoffs. For 2025, that's not something we can guarantee. Uh, we're talking about this very publicly, so it might be the case by the time we get there. Um, but there, there could likely be positions that uh, are laid off with this scenario. Um, this next one, eight additional FT at the library. Um, I'll speak briefly to the impacts, and if you like more information, Scott can fill in, but it's elimination of Sunday service, uh, so you'd be open uh, Tuesday through Saturday uh, from 10 to 6. Currently, it's open two, two additional hours, so um, one day less, lower hours, and 50% of the programming. So some of the, the story times, the reptile man, all those programs, about 50% of that would be reduced. So I, again, I'm maybe I'm supposed to wait, but I don't know when it'll come back. Uh, in the small group breakout sessions that we had with council, which I deeply appreciate, um, one of the questions that I had asked is, what's the break break even point for the library? So these are, in my opinion, they're all terrible. These will all cause harm to our community, which is why I personally, and, and a majority of council, in my opinion, didn't agree with any of these cuts. But these cuts may be forced upon us and we will have to budget within the constraints as the voters determine um, this November. So knowing that I, I may have to make these decisions as a counselor uh, and to Councillor Gonzalez's point, you know, these literally are life and death decisions. So as painful it is for me to like ask these questions, I feel like I'm obliged to for our community safety. How many library days could we reduce before the, I've heard from staff that Getting rid of the library actually costs us money because it's a way that we get revenue by participating and sharing our library inventory with other communities. Um, so yeah, that was a question I'd ask staff. Ben, have you guys gotten that information? It sounds like we're reducing it by one day, and that's eight FTE. Do we have an extra library day to spare, or does that actually cost us money? We, uh, Councillor, we can certainly um, we can consider a lot of different scenarios to to do further reductions. Um, I think you're referring to our cooperative library agreement where yeah. we receive funds from the, the cooperative uh, Chemeketa agreement. And I think it's about 600,000 a year, roughly, uh, that we get in revenue from that. Um, the, the, as you call it, kind of the, the tipping point or the breaking point is we have to maintain a level of service that we can share our materials between libraries cooperatively. If, 
we get to a point where we're really not able to do that, that's where we lose that revenue. So um, somewhere in there is where, where we kind of go the other direction with loss of that revenue. Uh, and then you know, that just compounds our, our further reduction. So there's a number of scenarios we could consider to, to reduce the days further at some point. We're not sure exactly what that is, but we can, we can work on those scenarios. We need to know the minimum number necessary to participate in that, I think, for future reference. I think it's important to have that available to us just to consider. I'm hoping that we don't come anywhere near it, but I want to know the number. I have a related question while we're <clears throat> talking about potential homework assignments, I suppose, for our staff. Some positions do create revenue for the city. And did the leadership team consider that in, in making its proposal over which vacancies to cut, which, vac which vacancies to cut, and which layoffs to suggest if we get to that point? Yes, as we continue through 2025, that's part of this conversation for Center 50 Plus and for Recreation. So why don't we continue that? Great, thank you. Yeah, so the next item, Center 50 Plus, uh, as proposed, it's broken into a reduction and some cost recovery. About half of it is reduction of service, not necessarily FTE, but it contracted services. Uh, the rest would be additional fees. Uh, um, things that, that have been considered as a non-resident fee. Currently, non-residents and residents pay the same uh, for programs at Center 50 Plus, um, but some combination, um, and there's a full list in your packet of what that would look like, but half cost recovery, half production. Uh, on recreation, we're just looking for additional cost recovery, so no, no reduction scenario, but really looking at our fees, eliminating subsidies, and uh, getting an additional $400,000 of uh, cost recovery for the recreation programs. So basically charging users $400,000 more a year to, to, for the services. Correct. Currently, non-residents pay the exact same. Um, you know, our, our intent, our discussion has been to actually do some a market analysis to see where that tipping point is, because there is a tipping point where if you charge too much, people aren't going to use it and you lose revenue. So where, where is that point um, for recreation? And that includes softball. Josh, just an important point for uh, Mayor and Council be aware, I think you kind of touched it, but this would also uh, include things such as elimination of our ability to fund our fee reductions for, uh, for those families that can't afford the program access. It would also potentially affect our facility use permits that we waive for uh, nonprofit organizations, which would take a good bit of those. So there's some things like that that do get impacted. Are there fee reductions also for seniors for certain programs? Uh, not, not necessarily. No, we I mean, we have our center fifty. Those are those programs are all what, whatever the cost has been in our just general recreation. No, we don't we don't differentiate. That's one of the things that Josh was referring to. Is I think we need to look at some scenarios where we have some differentiation, but particularly the the non city resident scenario. I, I was we thinking not, more of yeah. Center 50 Plus and some of the programs. I mean, I know it operates with a lot of volunteers, but there are a lot of seniors on fixed incomes. And That's our primary audience and our primary participation group. So all of our, all of our efforts to uh, make that, those programs and the facility accessible to that, primarily to that group, are focused on that effort. So you could kind of say, in, in essence, yes, but... Those are all based on you know, all the fundraising and all of the volunteers. Okay, thanks. I mean, I just want to remind the community again that uh, Center 50 Plus is, I think, the main launching place for Meals on Wheels in our community. So when I when I look at reductions to this line item in our budget, again, this is going to cause real harm in our community. This could cost us lives, and it will cause harm. So none of these cuts are are I think suggested from our manager or the leadership team. Lightly, I think that this is a smorgasbord of awful, but I think that it, you know, we have to plan for this possibility. Otherwise, we'll hit the ground flat-footed, and it'll be like hitting a wall. So I, you know, I have no specific question on this, but it's just this is devastating. Josh, want to continue? Sure. Uh, the next line is parks operations. We're looking at the equivalent of seven FT, similar. Uh, it could be actual positions or it could be uh, we contract for a lot of services there too. 
uh, but approximately seven FT equivalent there. Uh, the impacts are uh, pretty severe. If you look in your back at the list, um, it would include you know much less maintenance, um, no after hour restrooms, uh, likely not watering at neighborhood parks. So they would go brown and dormant in the in the summertime, um, as well as a whole other list. Scott, do you want to touch on any uh, of those things, such as um, splash pads or our park staff ability to respond to our uh, homelessness impacts in the parks in addition to our SOS teams, uh, reduced frequency of mowing, garbage, restroom cleaning, just a, a whole host of uh, reduced level of service. I had a question for Dan Atchison. Um, when I kind of picture that, that impact to our neighborhood parks, um, very hard to close a neighborhood park. You know, I think we were talking about this with you before, you know, it, they're most of the time they're very wide open for the whole community to access. Um, but with a reduction in the service and maintenance to the area, how does that, does that open us up to any kind of liability concerns with, you know, the maintenance going down, but yet people still having access to the space? Parks are, are a bit of a, a one-off there because of the recreational immunity statutes. Okay. That, that said, overall, you know, is, is it possible that be more claims or more injuries because the property is maintained as certain as possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, continuing with 2025, uh, the Youth Development Program and Community Services, it's currently one FTE and a series of grants as proposed for elimination. Uh, if you might remember, we uh, proposed it several years ago for elimination. Also, and again, Josh, just to clarify, <coughs> when you say fiscal year 2025, you mean July 1st, 2024. Correct. Yes. I think that's an important thing for people who aren't wonky. To yeah. Remember. Understood. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> no offense. I, uh, in the packet, it shows the dates. It should show the dates here. I appreciate that. Uh, in the police graffiti abatement, we currently have two positions. This is proposed to eliminate the first position. You'll see the second one later on. Uh, social service grants, the Urban Development Department currently administers $400,000. Uh, Center for Hope and Safety, Marion Polk Food Share, uh, several other programs, people apply and receive them. Uh, we're proposing to eliminate that. Again, it's 2025, not for the current year. Um, quick question about youth development. Is that Scott? Um, do you know how many um, youth participate in those programs that we have? I don't have that number. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's significant. It's our you know so we have the summer programs, uh, year round leadership, uh, a lot of prevention programs. I'm sorry, I don't I don't have the okay. numbers at hand. Okay. Yeah, um, I was part of trying to keep Care Corps going and uh, during the pandemic, um, and I um, I really appreciate the work that 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 we do in that area. I think it's, you know, when uh, police officers talk about prevention work out there, this is a way social service wise that we do prevention work at, um, for, you know, get, gaining access to those youth who are maybe are at risk um, and kind of bringing them in and, and trying to support them in ways that um, that we can through business and um, through the city. So I'm, I'm really devastated to see this, this go. Um, I know the graffiti abatement is going to be a huge hit for my area of town. I know Councilor Gonzalez's area of town as well. Uh, Mayor, out where you live, um, in the downtown area that you and I share. Um, I know that there are consequences for that as well that are far reaching. Um, that last bullet there under 2025, which is again June 2024, uh, a safe park and the warming centers. So there's about uh, $510,000 total in the non-departmental general fund. Uh, there's also some environmental cleanup for larger camp cleanups where the SOS team can't do it all alone. We hire a you know, service master or a different provider to help with that. Um, so that would end in 2025. Uh, the next couple bullets, uh, it's, it's pretty short, but it's very impactful. Um, for fiscal year 2026, which you know, about a year and a half away, uh, very, very quickly. July 2025. Yes, July 2025. Uh, all Salem funding for the Navigation Center. Currently, we have pass-through funding from the state. 
Um, we're using that to operate the navigation center. We could have a little bit uh, left over. It's uh, to be determined. We're still kind of seeing what that looks like. Um, but there's no new funding coming from Salem, at least at this point. So uh, the current operator would look somewhere else for that funding. Um, the next one is a fire station, 9 FTE. As the chief mentioned, currently we have 43 people at any given time. This would take it down to 40. So you're reducing one station, one engine on all, all the shifts. Uh, and then the police, 12 FTE. Uh, this includes uh, 10 officers, the other graffiti abatement person, and then a telephone reporting specialist. Uh, and in those 10 officers it includes a homeless response team, and then the community action unit, and the community action unit, the other eight FTE. And then just real quick, uh, we're not noting 2027 because the way the reductions work, uh, they're substantial enough that you don't need another one until 2028. Um, but 2028 is a second fire station, so an additional nine FTE, taking an additional uh, three off of that 43, so taking it down to 37. One of the things that I find helpful when I'm looking at, you know, this is this is general fund uh, employees, which I think is around 557 or now maybe up to 560, give or take, I mean, 760, 757, um, which is nearly identical to what it was in 2008. Um, we're just now barely above it by a few. Um, it's my understanding that police and fire, which is the obligation of every general purpose, you know, city like our own, to staff and employ makes up about you know, 60, 65% of our general fund. And essentially that's true for, for every municipality. I mean, no one else is gonna provide police and fire for us as a city. So is that part of the reason why you know, we're looking at such substantial cuts is because that is what the general fund does? It, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, as Councilor Gonzalez pointed out, this is one scenario there are certainly hundreds of choices you could pick. Uh, the police and fire public safety is the majority of the general fund. Uh, I look back a couple decades, 2002, property taxes have never fully funded police and fire, uh, you know, as far back as I could look. Um, so we've relied on other, other funding mechanisms. There's just not enough else in the general fund um, to make up the, the reductions you'd have to get to. Even if you eliminate all the parks, all of library, you wouldn't get there. When you say else, I don't know what that means. Sorry, the uh, non-public safety services in the general fund. So it's, it's just math. It is just math. You can't get to the reductions without impacting public safety. Which is terrifying. Um, just real quick, I have a few charts that kind of try to visualize this and I apologize if it doesn't work. Um, but what I'm looking at is the reductions as a percent of the department budget um, for each of the years. So, so this is where we're trying to insulate some of the other services until longer uh, in the picture. So again, that's a percent of the general fund budget. So if you're looking at the police reductions, it's about a million dollars year one. You can see the police reductions are about 1.72% of the police of the general police fund general fund budget. budget. Yes. 2.3% of the fire general fund. Those six positions, yes. So, so that's where, as we go further, you can see community services, you add those other library positions, it adds to that reduction. You go even further. Um, this is where you have the other station. Is this cumulative? It is cumulative for each okay. individual year. So yes. in 2027, we hope we'll have reduced the fire department by 9.99%, police by 5.69%, so on. Correct, yes. So, Going back to the work session goals, uh, this first section of you know, how we got here, the current and projected financial picture, and walking through the potential budget reductions again, it's just one potential scenario. Uh, we could literally throw hundreds of scenarios at you and you could pick. 
Um, what we'd prefer is to get direction from you and we come back with something else. This will not be the last time we talk about it. We're anticipating more discussions will be needed, um, but it's really hard for a group to come up with something. So now you have something to react to. Thanks, Josh. I want to take the temperature for a minute. What are we thinking? I have questions. <laughs> Do you need a point? No, I'm just asking you. I just wanted something to ask you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm, good. I'm okay. Okay, let's keep going. Councilor Phillips. So, so my questions and comments in this smorgasbord of awful with very concerning, um, you know, projected, uh, necessitated, uh, uh, or necessary uh, obligated reductions in staff uh, would be to not freeze the SOS team, but to fully expand it to seven days a week. I am fully aware that that would require reductions in other places, which is one of the reasons why I was uh, picking on the library uh, as an example of one of the things I could think of that might be less harmful for our community, but still harmful. Um, I think that with the reduction in our managed micro shelter sites, uh, the prospect of not having a navigation center staffed that the, the demand on the successful SOS team um, that staff recognizes that we can't go less than five days a week will be even more important. Um, so I would like to look at scenarios that get us to seven days a week there. Um, I think that it will become even more of a, a keystone service that we provide. And then I have questions um, about uh, potentially still adding either a park ranger or uh, you know, not reducing parks uh, by as much as recommended, again, due to the fact that we may be uh, defunding and, and not sheltering, you know, between 180 and 255 community members. And that, uh, the experience that I've had in Ward 3, when they've, uh, you know, community members, like the Morningside Neighborhood Association, have interacted with the SOS team successfully, is that it was really the park ranger on weekends that was key for, you know, interfacing, going out and seeing what was happening in real time. So uh, you know, none of this is good news. I'm, I'm opposed to all of these cuts, but it may be outside of my control. Um, and if we have to do the best we can in a bad situation, I would like to see a scenario where the SOS team gets to seven days a week and then something like maybe adding a park ranger or not reducing uh, park operations by as much as we're recommending, specifically because I think that that may have a, a worse outcome than we anticipate because of you know, how much worse uh, we'll have uh, more work cut out for us in terms of our neighbor uh, community members that are unsheltered. Yeah. Thanks, Councilor. Yeah. Can I follow? Yeah. Just for clarification, and I'm understanding your your line of questioning that we should look for those reductions outside of police and fire. Yes. So good, great clarifying. I. Uh, Yes, absolutely. I don't support, you know, cutting those. I think it's wise the way that you guys have structured this in the sense of delaying the cuts to police and fire for as long as we can um, so that the community can engage in a serious effort to find other ways to raise revenue. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, if, if we are not successful at raising revenue in November, I hope we are. But if we're not, like, the, the need does not go away. So absolutely. This is probably for you. It's in regards to the West Salem Library. If the library closes, and what is the risk of us losing that property forever, for forever after that? There is a um, there is a clause, some language in our lease agreement that that does create a scenario that says we are for the the property owner. Uh, which is the owner of the Roths uh, Hall there, we are supposed to operate it as a library. And if we don't, that property can default back to its original condition, which means the building doesn't exist. Um, because we own the building, we don't own the land. That exactly. is correct. We do not own the land, but we do own the building. And so that is at risk. Um, I, we haven't had that conversation yet, but I think that conversation will need to happen with, the, with our, our landlord there. In terms of, is there any option to negotiate you know, down from that? But that's that's what the language says. Right? But even if we were open one day a week, we'd 
still satisfy the, <laughs> the lease I'm agreement? Not, I'm I don't not know. the city attorney, uh, and I would, <laughs> I would ask uh, Mr. Atchison to review okay. that more okay. specifically, but um, sure. my understanding is that we have to provide some level of service at that building, so whatever that, however that gets interpreted. Scott, when we're talking about the library, do we still have the bookmobile, like an, uh, the, the ability to go out into the community? We do. Okay, is that on? Is that something that's going to be cut? We're not proposing any. There, our current scenario, and I'm looking at Bridget just to kind of give me a thumbs up or down, but we're not under our current scenario of reductions. I don't think that's necessarily at risk. But please feel free to. So with the Bridget Esquata, our interim library director. Um, we would have to cut how often we can do bookmobile services, and that um, we go out to lots of schools and provide outreach services. So that would have to be reduced based on the current staff that we have after all that. Yeah, I'm going to direct this to you, Mr. Archer, as well. I think that uh, because of what uh, many of us are asking, I think you're going to have work cut out trying to piece out what things from parks and libraries, Center 50, we could reduce or cut or close, but yet still keep maybe one day at West Salem. Um, that might mean closing another day at Maine or a half a day. I think we're, I'm, I'm going to be asking you to provide more information about how we can narrow down those services without closing completely um, to be able to keep the public safety in place. And, um, and I know that, again, parks, they're open, or at least most. There are some that could close the gates. And those are oftentimes well used, but it might be if we have some of those closed and the trash cans removed so that trash doesn't pile up in them or however, I think it'd be nice to know if we can find ways to piece out some of these closures or expenses um, would be helpful to understand what we could maintain. And along those lines, I'd be interested to know if we have visitor numbers at the West Salem branch on a, on a particular day. I, I don't remember if that is that included. Um, it's not included in your packet, but uh, we fortunately somebody uh, just asked about that today. Um, last last year, our our uh, total visitors at that branch was just under twenty five thousand per year. Per year, yeah, for last year. Plus fiscal. Limited and hours. they're currently yeah. open five days a week? Five days a week, five hours a day. Okay. Mr. Archer, sorry for calling you Scott earlier. <clears throat> um, Scott works great for okay. <laughs> Do you know the number of people who uh, visit this library? We didn't ask that, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to look at our library and again and see if uh, I just pulled up today. <laughs> Um, so last year, last fiscal year from July 2022 to June of 2023, we had over 321,000 visitors. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for sitting in the front row, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 321,000. Yeah, I couldn't hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, can I up turn the up cart a little bit? Sure. Okay. Um, I've been thinking about this and just trying to think outside the box and, you know, try and imagine any kind of, as you said, there's millions of things and ways that we could cut this up. And I got to thinking about, um, you know, if we just completely redid what we have traditionally done or thought we should have done as a city, right? Uh, historically, what we have provided as a service and actually ask the question, what do our residents need? Um, and just start at that baseline instead of the historical. And I got thinking about the hierarchy of needs um, and just the base understanding that we all as humans, we need food and water and shelter. And the next one up is safety. And I would 
you know, that first one, I would put things like, you know, our sheltering services. I would put um, Meals on Wheels and Marion Polk Food Chair, um, the SOS team, you know, all of those different things that we use for helping um, some of our most vulnerable residents now. And then the next one up is safety. And of course, I would put our fire and police um, and EMS, all of that within that next one. And then the next one up is belonging. And of course, that's where we find parks and libraries and Center 50 plus. And then as it goes up, uh, you know, we look at purpose. And of course, that's economic development and jobs and the creation of jobs within our city. Um, and I wonder if if we had a chance to just totally redo what what we thought was possible for a city to provide or what we thought was morally or ethically or our values moving forward i i wonder i wonder what that would look like and i wonder if there is a budget that looks like that you know what does it look like when we prioritize services for our unhoused i would say that that crisis in our community impacts every other thing that we do. Um, it impacts the library, it impacts police and fire and EMS and our community livability and our downtown businesses and economic development and people moving to our city and tourism and all of these different areas. What if we made that our baseline and said this is what we're going to commit to doing and then from there, we're going to make sure that the safety is, is considered and then from there move on to the livability factors for all of us. That was just a really big idea and I wanted to just bring it here. I, 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 thank you. Uh, I think that's an interesting way to look at this. I'm wondering where we would get the statistics or information to guide how that portion of it but haven't mm -hmm. thinking about it okay but thank you for bringing that up just to continue the homeless response services that we have is a 10 or 11 million dollar question so we would have to pull another 10 or 11 million dollars out of this equation in order to put those services back into our budget mm -hmm. so which you know would just absolutely it would mean closing the library you know, it would mean coming very close to closing our parks and recreation facilities it would impact police and fire to a greater extent than we've already impacted so, although, you know, certainly possible to approach it from that equation perspective, we simply don't have the revenue in the system to support that sort of, that additional service demand. We, we've, we took the approach that responding to homelessness is not a core function of a municipal government. That is a function of the state and of the county, uh, and then the city is sort of the, the entity of last resort there. So that's how we approached it. That would be turning that on its head. And I understand you know, my my heart says, yeah, we should do that. But the reality of you know looking at this says there's no way we can do that. And I appreciate that. And you and I have had so many conversations about you know, traditionally what city, the role of city government has been and my personal frustrations at the lack of support farther up the chain of command um, as far as uh, support from our counties, support from the state um, has been frustrating to say the least. Um, my other question though is when we do, you know, we talk about these different reductions, but when we say that we're not going to do our unmanaged or we're not going to do our managed camping or our um, micro shelters or um, the navigation center, those kind of seem like one line item issues, but the impacts of that on police and fire and EMS and businesses downtown and tourism, I mean, just on and on and on. I mean, I don't think that we can quantify that in a slideshow. 
But I think you can make that argument about almost every one of these programs. Sure. Yeah. You can make that argument about our library. You can make that argument about our parks. They all, they're all interrelated and they're all gonna impact probably crime in a negative way. They're gonna impact livability in a negative way. All of those things. I mean, all of those, part, we're only doing, I mean, people have a perception that we're doing a lot of extra stuff. We're not, we're not. We're doing basics that really impact um, our community livability. And there's a bunch of extra stuff out there that we're doing. Councilor Stable, or Councilor Phillips. Um, uh, my, my question slash comment has to do with just verifying with this, uh, you know, if we don't find additional revenue this November, um, I assume that this math means that uh, staffing up a new uh, fire station, you know, eight, nine years from now in Ward 3 is not going to happen. Um, getting two new libraries in our community staffed up, which, which are things the community has voted on and voted very resoundingly in favor of doing. Um, what they voted on was just the potential for infrastructure and buildings, but not actually operations because of the way those those bonds work. They can only buy a thing. They can't buy the services. So I just want to verify that those those are basically off the table as as part of this presentation. There's no additional you know funding for libraries, uh, you know, community libraries out in North Salem or South Salem. And there's no additional funding for a new fire station. That's correct. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, actually, we wouldn't propose to continue with the construction. Right. Uh, we repro would propose to hold that funding uh, until the staffing was available. It doesn't make sense to build something and then let it sit empty. Yeah. So I guess my follow-up question um, has to do with um, you know the consequences of looking at potentially redu reduced call times, uh, reduced fire services, reduced police services. Do we have any sense or is there any way to quantify the impact that would have on like property insurance, business insurance, you know, health insurance? Like what's that going to cost us as individuals in our city? Because I assume that the rates are not going to go down. Yeah, it's uh, the impact probably be more on commercial than it will be on residential okay. uh, for, for fire protection. Um, the biggest impact, to be honest with you, is on the citizens. Um, right now, there's 5,500, approximately 5,500 people that had an emergency last year, critical emergency, life-threatening life emergency, did not receive a five-and-a-half-minute response. Uh, when you close the first station, that jumps to 8,800 people. When you close the second station, it jumps to over 10,000 people, 10,600 a year. They're assuming the same call load, call load as now. That's what they increase. Our 6.1% our increase is built into that. So. We're going to have station station three, which is out of Lansing. Uh, I want to say they're running close to 5,000 calls. They're being dispatched to 5,000. They can't run 5,000, so other yeah. stations are having to run. They're going to run, uh, in 2028, they're going to run 9,000 calls if we close those two stations. That That's not, you, you can't, I mean, that's 27 calls in a 24-hour period. It's insane. So, I, I bet that, sorry, the last follow-up question, because I see that other councils have stuff to say. Uh, you know, if we're not successful in November, um, I've, I've heard the multiple community uh, points of interaction talk about the need for uh, compensation in lieu of taxes from the, the state of Oregon, having $2 billion of infrastructure here um, that's untaxed properties. Uh, I mean, I think that that's something that we need to strongly look at moving forward to reduce the, the impact of additional revenues on our community members. And then, uh, you know, I guess my question would be, when will we start looking at the feasibility of like plan B um, and uh, like, how can we help, you know, facilitate with that? Like what's, what's the real world timeline of like, uh, like a, what is it called? A levy? Other yeah. Other sources of revenue. So, uh, so it really depends on what the source is. If you're talking about a local option levy, it yeah. has to go to a May or November election and then it rolls on the following tax year. So, for example, if you had a property tax levy on the May ballot, we'd receive the funding the following November, if it passed. So, Councilor, to direct, directly respond to a couple of your points, you know, those, the conversation about payment and load taxes, those are ongoing. Yeah. Those are, we haven't stopped with those. We're, we're, I mean, I'm continuing to look under every rock that I can for revenue, regardless of what happens in November. But of course, uh, if, the, if the payroll tax fails in November, it just makes those those conversations more dire. Yeah. Uh, but those are ongoing um, and continuing. 
Thank you for your leadership. I'm aware that when you're in the state legislature, you introduced a, a motion to do that very thing. So thank you. And, and I'm continuing those conversations. Yeah. So. Over here. so I Councilor just, Glenn. I, sorry. Oh. sorry um, has the management team had any conversations about considering like a furlough day, like the, uh, the state did? Obviously, the Unions won't allow some of them, but that was just one question. We, we have had those conversations, and our consensus was that those are really great for temporary situations, but what we're talking about here is a long-term structural imbalance, and we need to make the long-term adjustments. I just meant for the interim until we can like, figure out structural imbalance. It, it could certainly provide some uh, short-term cash flow. You're absolutely right. If there was something on the horizon, it, it, it could help for sure. But, but Keith is correct. As a, as a long-term measure, um, it, it doesn't solve the problem. So, and not to get into the weeds, but we get into the weeds a little bit. So like, um, for, I just wonder if we shouldn't get into the weeds a little bit, and not tonight's not the time to do that. But I, I just noticed on some of the line items that we've gone like triple from 2021 to 2024 budget, like for mayor and council uh, administration, other professional services. We were budgeted 61,000 in 2021, and for 2024, 227,600. So I was just curious, so, like what the difference? So the main thing there is interpreter services and then our federal lobbyist that was added. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll spend as much time as you'd like in the weeds with every single one of you. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm willing to set aside hours to do that. Uh, happy to walk through every line. Well, and there were a couple like radio things and I was curious what those were for both police and fire. Yeah, I was uh, curious about that one too. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you want the answer now? I, I'm just curious. So we had to raise our radio rates. Uh, we're due to replace our, our radios. I think it's every 10 or 12 years we replace them. Uh, they're due to be replaced in 2026. Um, we set aside money every year in a reserve account to be able to replace those. Well, the radios went up significantly in price uh, this year, and we were not going to have enough money in 2026 to replace them. And so we had to up our annual contributions the next two years to be able to have the money to replace those. And the other one you may have seen in there was the, the uh, radio switch as well. We, we raised radio rates. Um, WVCC uh, Dispatch Center has one switch, master switch, that controls everything. It's got two cores in it. I'm familiar. Yes, and if those both fail, we're out of business. So 911 goes away. That's not an acceptable scenario. So <clears throat> really a single point of failure. And, and when I took over three years ago, those were the things I wanted to identify. And so we've identified that as a single point of failure. We want to have another core switch. Um, we'll need that when we relocate that center at some point in the future. We'll have to have two switches anyway. And that gives us four, four, four times of failure before we actually 911 goes away. So most big centers were the second biggest in the state operate with two switches. We didn't have a second switch. So we had to add significant money to that for the next couple of years. And I think we're replacing that in 20, 2027 or 28. So and, we'll have two switches. There. And those are internal rates that are charged to all radio users. So public works, police, fire are the, are the main ones. And it was a big, I mean, it was a big increase. Yeah. Councilor Norbeck. Great discussion. I think you have won it all. When I was in state government, I was in state government for about 15 years. I've been through furloughs. I've been through a variety of budgetary scenarios. And I was started out as a law clerk at the time, so I was not on the leadership team for budget decisions. But what I observed is that nobody was laid off until there was nothing left to do. So, that is my approach and it was extremely painful. We had to lay off two employees within our specific unit at the Oregon Department of Justice and it was horrible. I, I can tell the managers hated having to decide who those two people are. Nobody wants to make that decision. 
That experience informs my outlook to this process. I prefer elimination vacancies over layoffs wherever possible, which is why I asked earlier tonight, how many vacancies do we have right now? And I know that number will ebb and flow. I've heard in the past that we had 70 or so vacancies citywide. So as we get closer to actually making decisions, what I want to know and will always want to know is, what is the total number of vacancies? What is the number of vacancies per department? And what is the number of vacancies over six months old? And I mentioned that specifically because I know there are some vacancies that we just can't fill. And I would not understand laying off somebody instead of over holding a position open that we have been struggling to fill or keep. I know sometimes people will fill a position, you're like, oh, thank God, we finally filled this position. We've been posting it forever. And that position is difficult to maintain. So I don't necessarily look at, at it from a needs perspective. I have a much more, uh, I suppose, numbers driven approach, which is I would rather eliminate vacancies before we lay off people who have chosen public service with the city as their career. I would also be curious to know what furloughs look like. I understand the city manager's response. Yeah, that's not a long term <clears throat> fix. The forecasting we're relying upon assumes no new revenue. It assumes the, the state and the feds will never give us further support in the areas they have suddenly and sometimes surprisingly given us support. We received a $10 million grant from the state of Oregon to spend on housing and homelessness services. The governor issued an emergency order for millions more around the state at the start of her term this year. We can't predict if and when the state will support us in that arena. Uh, I would be curious to know though, can furloughs help? And what do the employees think about that? Because furloughs are painful and I'm sure there are a number of city employees who live paycheck to paycheck. So I don't suggest that lightly, but I would at least like to know what would that look like? How much savings would that entail? I would at least like information before we automatically take it off. And another thing I would add, um, Minto Brown is in my ward and Nelson Park is in my ward. Nelson Park is just a neighborhood park, but that was my park growing up. Uh, the parks are a tremendous resource and they're one of the truly free resources to anybody. Uh, anyone has a neighborhood park in their neighborhood, they can walk to. And many people from all over the city and beyond come to Minto Brown. It's one of the crown jewels of our city. It's the best park in the city. I said it. Uh, <laughs> so I understand the, you know, the need for the park rangers specifically because I see them from time to time and our parks volunteers. I know that what's not reflected on the spreadsheets in front of us are the sheer volume of parks volunteers. Folks like the Mission Street Conservancy people. Uh, folks who tend to the Rose Gardens, uh, folks who do a huge number of things that go above and beyond what our park staff do to keep them clean and beautiful and accessible to one and all. So I'm very reticent to make that a priority in cutting. I would also notice that given in our materials, there is a potential for $400,000 in cost recovery and recreation on the same page, just below it, it recommends $700,000 in cuts to parks operations. If we use that $400,000 in cost recovery towards to offset the parks operations, that in and of itself could assist us in keeping our parks in the condition that our residents have come to expect. So, but I'm not gonna go line by line tonight, but I wanted to lay out kind of my overarching belief, which is, I would rather eliminate vacancies over eliminating layoffs over jobs whenever possible. Yeah, no, I, uh, tough discussion, but I think we needed this discussion. You know, um, I agree with uh, Councilor Phillips' uh, ideas as far as not reducing the SOS to peace and fire, but also maybe I'd like to see what it would what it would look like if we bought the uh, city operations if we can hire them with more. It's just a bit, so we can give the city a little more time 
to go back and start having those discussions at council members, different you know, it's, it's best with you. You know, but I also wanted to uh, read something that a staff member uh, sent out, and just a snippet of her email, and this is her to her staff, one of our one of our staff. Please know that our priority remains focused on maintaining our team's productivity, efficiency, and capacity. Managers will be tasked to look at the current capacity to optimize our workflow and our current resources. I encourage everyone to share your thoughts and ideas how we can work together to navigate the situation, close any gaps in service, and provide assistance to staff who may feel more strained than others during this time. I'm committed to being transparent and open to the process, so please let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you for understanding this decision. Your flexibility and dedication to the team, looking at the past budget challenges, it is nothing we have not been through before. Please know we will fill vacant positions once we have a revenue issue resolved. Your hard work is greatly appreciated. I'm confident that we can overcome these challenges together. This is Bridget right here in front of us. And I was just, I am so kidding me to out you. <laughs> but I just, when I saw that email, you know, that's, the, that's the spirit we need during this time. Even though these are tough discussions, but I just really appreciate one of the things. Um, thank you for saying all that and reading that. Reading that is really beautiful. You write an email. Fantastic. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, you know I I bring ideas here just just as ideas. Um, my my plan A is that the payroll tax gets voted in and we can continue to uh, give the services that our community deserves and demands that we can continue to handle our unhoused crisis um, in, a, in a way that's moving us in a positive direction um, and that we can slowly start making those investments towards the future that I think we all want. Um, you know, I know that within that we're talking about increasing our community policing skills and, and opportunities and all of those things that I know that our whole community um, is really trying to get towards that future. And for me, that's that's the payroll tax. That's why um, me and my friends, <laughs> handful of friends, started the SaveSalem.org group. Um, and we're trying to do just that. We're trying to win at the ballot. And um, I'm going to throw my all into that to get it to pass um, because that's my plan A. That's the best thing that I have was an option that was put before me that was the best one. And I took it and I'm going to run for it and I'm going to try to get it done. Um, plan B, I, I think that you guys have brought forward um, a, a devastating document, but one that I understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, my idea is about, you know, rethinking how we how we think about things is really just to continue to to bring forward new ideas and to challenge long held beliefs. Um, so that we can continue to challenge each other and bring forth maybe good ideas or, or whatever it is. Um, I do want to say I agree with you, Councillor Phillips, on the SOS team, um, preserving that as long as possible and hopefully um, increasing it because it is such a benefit to the whole city. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say all that and, and none of these cuts I'm happy about. Um, not to parks, not to libraries, not to any of it. So. I guess just to share my thoughts on, I mean, I feel like the staff has done a really good job of making the best out of a horrible situation. I'm not willing to live with any of these. I, I can't accept any of these cuts. Um, and so I'm going to be working hard to try to make sure that we don't have to experience these cuts because we've been working uh, since I've been on council since 2017 and building up our homeless response. I remember what Salem looked like. I remember what downtown was like before we had a homelessness response. I am not willing to go back there. I, mean, I any scenario that cuts those services, we're already in the middle of a humanitarian crisis. People are going to die, and our city is going to be uh, a very different place than it is today, and not in a good way if, if we cut those services. Uh, I'm not willing to have a city without a library. I'm not. This is not acceptable, and we, you know, um, hate the idea of cutting any library services, but uh, we certainly uh, can't lose our library, and we can't lose our public safety services. The number one thing I hear from the community, and I'm out talking to community members every day, is uh, we need more, uh, we're not feeling as safe as we would like to, and we need more services. So 
um, and of course, Center 50 Plus and uh, all of the others are critical. They're critical. If you go to any of those places, you will see people thriving there because of those services. And if we eliminate them, I can't even, I can't even go there. Uh, so we've got to work hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So those are my thoughts. I don't have any other suggestions on how you could, how you could get a better package. I think Councillor Phillips' uh, statement of a smorgasbord of terribles or whatever it was that he awful. said, awful, of course, smorgasbord of awful is 100% is accurate. So, yeah. Councillor Nishioka. Thank you. So I too feel that this is a smorgasbord of awful, awful, awful. And, um, and I am supporting the Safe Salem um, uh, tax measure and hope that it passes. Um, but at the same time, I'm prepared and ready to look at revenue sources as quickly as we can. I don't want anything to be cut. Um, I have, we have all of these audience members that don't want anything cut. Uh, and what I, I will have to say, I feel the, what has, what the good thing that's come out of this is people are now hearing. Before they thought, what? You need revenue? I don't understand. And I think the message has finally been received. And I think that we will see the support our community now understands we need. So I'm hoping that as we move forward, they'll understand why we don't want to cut anything and make great suggestions on how we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Are there other comments or other feedback? Just one, one thing in regards to vacancies, thank you, Councilor Nordic. That's where we started our conversation. We started with where are our vacancies, including both police, fire, libraries. Uh, uh, so we started there. And you know, obviously, we'll continue to look there. And as we look at different positions and they're affected, we're going to be looking for opportunities for people that are affected to move into those vacant positions, also where their skills match up. So. Uh, I understand that and agree with that approach. Uh, unfortunately, we we can't just have a hiring freeze and uh, use that as a tool. Again, it's not a structural solution. It's a that's a that's a great solution for a very short term uh, problem. Any other comments, questions? Feedback, things you want staff to look at, information you want them to provide so we can have the next iteration of this conversation. We heard loud and clear about in regards to vacancies and coming back with, a, with an assessment of the vacancies. Also heard looking at the impact of increasing the SOS team from four days a week to seven days a week. Uh, when we looked at that program, every person on the leadership team agreed that that program is delivering extraordinary value to our community. Uh, and without them, we, of course, would suffer, police and fire would suffer, parks and recreation would suffer. So we agree that there's a high level of, of return there. So we will, we will look at that. Uh, and we'll also look at what does it look like if we don't take anything out of police and fire at all until uh, 26, 27, and 28 into our, our three last years. So we'll give you a sense of what that would look like also and the impacts uh, associated with them. And potentially increasing the operation. My recommendation in regards to increasing fees would be to wait and see what happens in November, uh, but establish a, put the machinery in place to establish a revenue task force to have that conversation. So am I hearing correct, we're not going to be creating a revenue task force until after the election? I would wait until November. Okay. And to put the machinery in place? Yeah. And, and, and I do have some, some thoughts for what that would be. The last revenue task force was 2017. And as I recall, I believe it was mostly structured based on budget committee members and council members. Were there any outside <clears throat> There were, I think, only two counselors and two budget committee members. The rest were all community members. The only, okay, 
I, and the only challenge I see with that, on the one hand, I'm all in favor of community input. On the other hand, a lot of the budget committee folks know the budget better than anybody. So I don't know the correct formula. I'm not going to pretend to say I know what the correct formula is for what that makeup should be. But on the other hand, it takes a long time to truly understand this budget. And if you're going to invite members of the community to engage, if you do decide to do it, they're going to need a lot to catch up on. Uh, and I would also encourage whoever we choose to be a part of that to really take a look at our historically marginalized communities who traditionally have not had a seat at this table, have not been able to convey the things that are important to them, whether it's the parks in their neighborhoods, while the parks in Northeast have not gotten the lion's share of support or resources, for example. There's no library branch in North Salem, for example. Um, so anyway, those are just some thoughts I have as the mayor starts thinking about who he wants to appoint, because that's an important task force. And we ultimately took that task force's recommendation and made it into a payroll, the exception, I believe. The original task force did recommend putting on the ballot, is my understanding, from talking to its past chair. But in any event, I do think it'll be interesting to see moving forward. And I really appreciate folks participating tonight. I appreciate you being here. Uh, it is good to see folks engaging with us at council. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Varney. Um, thank you very much. Um, in terms of the revenue task force, um, uh, if we're not going to start it until after <coughs> November, it's still like some way that we can be having more of these discussions about it beforehand because I think really waiting till November is delaying something that we really need to do. Uh, back when I uh, voted to support the payroll tax, I mentioned that I felt I didn't like it, but I felt that we needed something to fill a gap in a hurry while we worked on other revenue sources, and I still feel that way. I don't feel it's the perfect solution. I think we need to work on other revenue options sooner rather than, than later. I mean, that's the way I feel about this. Uh, in terms of a budget committee, um, you're right. They have a lot of things they need to absorb. I think we have, what, how many vacancies? Two, two or three? I don't know, on the committee right now. Um, I would like to see a budget committee orientation occur in November to give them kind of a running start instead of waiting until January. So I think we're really, they're really going to need it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nishio. Thank you. Um, I too would second that. I would really like to be talking about um, revenue uh, potential so that uh, finance department could be. Um, Kind of running through some of those scenarios to give us ideas. Um, so I, I feel I'd like to do that sooner than later. But um, if the true if the true feeling is we need to wait till November, I understand that. So Josh, could you do me a favor maybe and get the the, the final report from the previous revenue task force out to everybody so they can get an idea because there's there's really a, a a limited number of options that we have when we're looking at new ideas and this is really like a nice primer on what what are the what are the options levy you know uh, payroll tax or business tax I mean there's about five or six options and that would I think help people kind of get back in that um, mindset as we consider that work going forward I think that would be really helpful yeah absolutely and I'll send out the charter and the previous membership also so everyone right. knows who was at the table perfect thank you thank you Keith, did you have something yes I did um, I just want to help council understand what, what we saw I'm aiming for, and that's coming with a revised budget in January of 2024. And council, Councilor Varney's comments about the budget committee sort of triggered my thinking about that. Uh, we will be convening a budget committee in you know first weeks of, of January 20, 10th. January 10th. Thank you, Josh. Of 2024, we would anticipate having a a revised budget then to present to them to start this conversation about amending the 20 our current year's budget or 2024 budget this year starting with a, a budget committee discussion of course you know, there'll be additional study sessions prior to that to continue this conversation 
I think just coming out of this meeting tonight, we have enough direction from staff to come back to the committee, to back, back to the committee, back to council uh, um, next month and continue this conversation. Uh, and if council is interested in pressing forward with a task force, we can come forward with a design for that task force and, and you know, charter and, and some things like that to set us up for, you know, that would be sometime mid, mid October, you know, November is only literally then only weeks away. So, you know, we're, we're, we're less than two months now. So, so plan on a third Monday work session, uh, basically round two of this? Yes. Okay. Right. All right. And we'll have options. Uh, we'll have to know more about the formal, the previous work, because I think most people weren't here then to know that work. So that'll be really helpful to have the background. Anything else? I'm sorry, Barney, did you say yes? Well, well, well you meant, thank you. Uh, you mentioned staff requests from staff. Um, I don't know if this already exists, but one of the questions I get asked a lot of times is, we pay property taxes, why isn't this covering everything? Okay, and something that's more of a graphic to explain that, or even something that shows um, the property tax revenue each year as a portion of the revenue needed to maintain general fund services and how that's changed over time. So um, I don't know if that would be helpful, just, just something like that. Yeah, so absolutely. Just to explain it. Thank you. Yeah. And just, just if I may, uh, if you think of something, if you are, have a question, feel free to reach out. It's always easier if we know about it ahead of time. Uh, we can have some time to put it together prior to your work session in, in October. Um, and happy to sit down with any one of you and go you know, line item by line item through the budget. Um, and it's, it, it's a lot. Just one, one other thing in regards to vacancies. I had asked Trevor to be prepared to speak about vacancies this evening. Uh, the opportunity really wasn't there to go into depth, but in October we can talk about police vacancies and the plan to fill those vacancies uh, over the course of the next year and what that looks like. Thank you. I just want to say I want to thank Mr. Staley and the whole leadership team for putting together this recommendation. I know this was painstaking, difficult, not fun work. I mean, I know that this was grueling. Having I've done this work before, it's no fun. It's, we all feel it. It all feels heavy, kind of gross right now. And I, I can imagine how, how difficult that was. And I really appreciate the thoughtful work that you all put in. Um, Thank you for giving us at least a start on uh, where we can head. So thank you. Brother. And if there's nothing else uh, before us, we are adjourned. Thank you.